Good morning, Grace Toady and friends here and there. Welcome back. I'm taking a couple of devotionals to talk about doing personal Bible study. Last time we said that you begin with prayer, then choose your book, should be a short one, and try to read the whole thing at one sitting. Shouldn't take that long. Then you begin to make observations, looking for key ideas and key words, highlighting or marking, even drawing pictures to force your brain to wrestle with the meaning of what the writer intended to communicate. You summarize each little paragraph and then try to integrate them into one sentence summarizing the chapter. It's a lot of work, but you'll find it very rewarding after you've done it. So observation asks, what does the text say? But as you're making notes, you are already begin to move into the next step, and that's interpretation. Interpretation asks, what does it mean? You're looking for the interpretation that the author intended. Let me give you an example of interpreting in the Bible. Beginning in about 1445 BC, God had Moses begin to write the Torah, the first five books of the law, first five books of the Bible. Joshua and others were instructed, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Joshua 1 verse 8. But it did depart from their mouth. Israel did not meditate on it day and night. At one point during the reign of King Josiah, the temple had become an old dusty storage building and someone found this big scroll. It was the Torah and they didn't even know what it was. Things changed for a little while, but Israel again walked away from God's word for decades. Then God sent the Jews into a 70 year captivity in Babylon. We talked about that yesterday. And it was there that they realized when they had ignored God's word. So they began to teach it. You can turn to Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, and that will be our verse for the day. Nehemiah 8, verses 7 and 8. And it says this, The priests helped the people to understand the law while the people stood in their places. They read from the book, from the law of the Lord, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Do you get that? You may not know it, but those verses became the basis for preaching in churches for the past 2,000 years. Reading from the Bible clearly, giving the sense so that people understand the passage. You open God's word, you pull it apart, expose the meaning of the text. We call it exposition or expository preaching. So, back to interpreting. You've made your observation notes, now what? Here's some basic rules of interpretation. Number one, interpret scripture literally. In most passages of the Bible, we can do what we do in normal life when reading a letter or a novel. We interpret the words and the sentences literally. When the writer penned the passage, he nearly always had a single meaning in mind. Therefore, there is only one correct interpretation, the author's. So we take the Bible for what it says literally. God's Spirit helped men write it down so that the common man could understand it. In law, we call this the plain meaning rule. Read it. What's the plain meaning? If the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense, lest you come up with nonsense, which a lot of lawyers do, come to think of it. So if a guy named Kevin and his family go to a holiday at the beach and write you a text saying, having a relaxing time, I made a bonfire on the beach last night and we roasted marshmallows. You shouldn't say, oh my, he is depressed. By relaxing, he means he's bored and wished he hadn't come. The bonfire is his anger toward other family members who are laughing too much. And roasting marshmallows means he gave his kids a hiding and sent them to bed early. Now that's ridiculous. There are some times when the plain sense doesn't make sense. Our God is a rock. Now you probably join me in saying that you don't want a rock to be your God. So when we say literal interpretation, we're also saying that we acknowledge different genres of writing, things like poetry, metaphors, our God is a rock. 
or similes. Our God is like a shelter from the storm, like a stream of water in a dry place, like the shadow of a mighty rock in a weary land, Isaiah 32. So number two, interpret scripture in its historical setting. In what historic setting was the book written? What was the author's background and experience? What did these words mean to the people while he was writing back then? This is obviously where a study Bible can help, and there are many online helps as well. <clears throat> a big area of debate in this regard is prophecy. What do we take literally and what is figurative, given the way people understood things back then? When Isaiah said, the wolf and the lamb shall graze together, is that talking about literal animals in Messiah's kingdom? How about every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill made low? Is that talking about making the actual landscape flat in the coming kingdom? Or is it saying that rulers will be hum humbled and, and the oppressed will be exalted? You have to do a little research into the historical context. You have to look at the history of the Jews to see expressions that they used. If they used mountains and hills to refer to evil rulers, ah, which they did, then we might say this is a colloquialism. It's an expression of the day. For instance, someone 1,000 years from now, 3020, found a note that you wrote about lekertekis. Should they conclude that people of your time liked to lick their shoes? Because perhaps back around the year 2000, shoes were made out of sugar cane and rubber, and when your shoes wore out, you could simply eat them. Yeah, their interpretation would be way off. So you have to do some historical research. But most sentences and passages you can interpret easily using the plain meaning rule. The plain sense makes sense, but it always helps to know the historical setting. Okay, so let's finish this morning by looking at the wonderful Jeremiah 29, 11 passage. If you turn to that passage, maybe you have it underlined with hearts and stars around it. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Such a great verse. All of the words seem pretty easy to understand, no mystical language, but now let's take a look at the context and the history. It's easy. Just start at verse 10 and read through verse 14. Okay, let's do it. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place, which is Jerusalem. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you in a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. There it is. <clears throat> Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, lived in the last years before Jerusalem was destroyed, and Jews like Daniel, who was a teenager, were taken into captivity in Babylon for 70 years. Daniel lived all the way through those 70 years. And at age 85, Daniel read this passage, Jeremiah 29. And he looked at his uh, calendar and started reminding the Lord, hey, Lord, 70 years is finished. <laughs> that is the correct interpretation of this passage, the correct meaning. But can we use this verse? Can we use it? Or should I throw out my coffee mug that I got from Kum Books? Using this verse comes from the application stage in your study. Observation, interpretation, and then application. Application asks, how should this impact me? Make me different, make my life pleasing to God. Often on my last PowerPoint slide in the message, I'll title it, So What? How can I apply this? Having more knowledge is just not enough. So let me suggest eight ways we can use principles from this passage. Number one, God chastens his disobedient children. He takes away privileges they take for granted. Number two, God's chastening can last a long time. 
God, uh, number three, God is never finally done with us. He revisits us because of his great grace. Number four, God wants what is good for us, not evil. Number five, God has caused our future in Christ to be filled with hope. Number six, when we call upon our God, he hears us. Number seven, we can find him when we seek him with all our heart, when we want his companionship. Number eight, God can restore our lives back to wonderful status after a hard time, but he doesn't always choose to do so because we tend to love the gift more than the giver. So these eight points are not the meaning or the interpretation of those verses. They are the application of principles in the text to God's children in our era 2,600 years later. And I believe those principles that I mentioned are consistent with other passages in the New Testament. So I hope this helps as you continue to read and study God's word. Don't just sit there waiting for the latest devotional from Grace Toady. This world may get much worse, and only people rooted and grounded in the word will hold fast when the winds begin to howl. Enough said. You have a great day.